Good evening. How are you all doing? It's good to be here tonight. Um, I have nothing up here but my name. We'll start with that. Uh, I do a lot of radio, so um, I'm just going to do my voice and tell a few stories about um, crossing the divide and what that means and what that could mean to all of us and what it meant to me. Now, I'm not 19. <laughs> I was once. It was a long time ago. But I'll tell a story that happened actually, I guess it would be 46 years ago, is that right? 56, it was a long time ago, 56 years ago. It took place in 1957, start here. 1957, this kid was 11 years old. And all he ever wanted to do was be a Boy Scout. Just wanted to be a scout. His uncle in England had sent him Lord Baden-Powell's original handbook. He read that handbook. He knew it came out of Native American Indian culture. He knew it came out of Zulu culture. He knew it came out of Britain. And he had a British mother. And uh, camping and outdoors and international brotherhood. And it just meant he had to be a Boy Scout. He had to be a Boy Scout. So he was 11 years old and goes running down to his kitchen. And in this kitchen is his mother, sitting there with Mrs. Jackson, who was a woman who worked in that house for a long time, and Mrs. Jackson's nephew, uh, Mr. Foster, who was a longshoreman. And um, so we sit down and said, Mom, he said, I, I've got to be a Boy Scout. I'm 11 years old, voice a little higher then. I have to be a Boy Scout, and it's time. So mom, being British, says, oh, that's lovely, dear. I believe we should. Monday morning, sign you up straight away, get you right in the Boy Scouts. There you go. I said, great. We got your uniform. Take you to Beth the Filla. Beth the Filla? Beth the Filla's a synagogue. I don't want to be in an all-Jewish group. It's the Boy Scouts. I want to be with everybody. Well, this is Baltimore. It was 1957. Baltimore was a southern city. Baltimore was a segregated city. There was a huge divide. Jews lived in one place, Ukrainians lived in another place, Poles lived over here, Italians lived over here, blacks and whites didn't live here and here, and if you were black, you couldn't go where white people went. We lived in segregation, legal segregation. It was divided. So Mr. Foster said, I am Boy Scout Master, and Scout Master, and the mother said, with a twinkle in her eye, hmm, that's a lovely idea. You should join his troop. Well, Mr. Foster was African-American, was black. In those days, if you were being polite, the word was Negro. So that day, Monday came around, Mr. Foster drove up in his Mercury. The little boy ran outside in his new little uniform, jumped in that car, and took a ride from Forest Park, down Forest Park Avenue, anybody knows Baltimore, made a right on Garrison Boulevard, went through Warbrook Junction, curved around to the left, and got to North Avenue. And the world began to change. And the world was the inner city. And the world was all these black people sitting on their steps and hanging out on the street and crossing Pennsylvania North Everybody clean, looking good, out in the street, and the little boy's nose is pressed up against the glass, looking, what is happening? What's going on here? Making that right down Broadway, hit National Avenue. Car pulls up, and there's the Faith Baptist Church. And the little boy walked out, walked into the basement of that church, and it was an integrated troop because he integrated the troop, a little white boy from Northwest Baltimore in this all-black, poor, working-class troop in 1957. That boy was me. And my mother was always a conspirator. She knew what she was doing. She knew how to get me to a place to cross these divides. And she had been crossing divides her whole life. When she was in Britain, she was an ambulance driver, would pull people out of the rubble during World War II. That was her job. But she crossed the divide early and made friends with colonial troops who fought for the British against the Nazis. So that was in her head. She got to America. She crossed the divide in the late 50s, and her best friend became a black woman. That never happened uh, in our worlds. So mom knew what she was doing when she sent me to this troop. 
But I stayed in that troop and didn't leave it. And my, some of my best, one of my best friends today comes from that troop, a man named Edwin Johnson. He became an auto worker, who was a former city councilman, member of the Black Panther Party. And that moment exploded my life and changed it completely. Things happened to me. One day we were driving back home. He was dropping off the kids from the troop. And we pulled up to this little candy store selling donuts, ice cream. And all the kids piled out of the car to go with Mr. Foster to go buy some ice cream. And I sat in the back of the car, didn't move. And he said, come on, come on, come on, come on, Mark, come on out. I said, no, no, I'll, I'll wait here. I'll just wait here. No, no, no. And he said, you don't understand. Wherever we can go, you can go. And that struck me like a ton of bricks, because I knew what he meant. And then other things began to happen. Edward and I were camping. Our mothers had packed our lunches. And we built our campfire, pitched our tent, built our campfire, getting things rolling. And Edwin pulled out these two skinny, little, long, skinny, shriveled up hot dogs. Out of my pack, I unwrapped my stuff, and my mom had picked, give me two thick lamb chops, that big. And Edwin's eyes just got huge, looking at those thick, huge lamb chops. We joke later on, he said, man, until I came to your house, I, when I said steak, I thought steakums, little skinny little things people would make. So we switched immediately and cooked each other's food and shared. And I began to hang out in his neighborhood, he began to hang out in my neighborhood. I went to his neighborhood, it was very different, sleeping three or four or five to a bed. He came to my neighborhood, he had his bed, I had mine. It took a while to get used, people get used to me, but people accepted me in his neighborhood and we hung out a lot. My neighborhood, no one accepted Edwin. No one accepted Edwin. Then we went to Boy Scout camp. And I was going down one day to get my canoeing merit badge. And a Boy Scout, we were the only black troop there. And this Boy Scout was hanging over the fence post from where he was camped out. And he said, uh, where's your camp? I said, up there, Troop 567 from Baltimore. And he looked at me and said, what are you doing to shoot with all them niggers for? And I remember that he hit me like a ton of bricks again. Boy Scout used that word? We're supposed to be about brotherhood. That's who we are. And one last piece. Shortly after that, I was 12. It was 1959. I'd been in the Boy Scouts a year, a little bit more than a year with, with Edwin and these guys. And it was almost time for my bar mitzvah. And I got a life, we got Life magazine. It was a magazine everybody used to get when we, in, in my growing up. It was all full of pictures of what's happening in the world. And, and I read it every time it came through. So I opened the Life magazine. And there was this picture in this Life magazine of this prison cell. And under that prison cell were two boots. Just sitting there, two boots. And it said, these are the boots of Mac Parker. Mac Parker, Poplarville, Mississippi, accused of raping a white woman was taken out of his jail and lynched. And it turns out, years later, because I stayed with this and that picture stayed on my wall forever, that Mac Parker didn't do anything, that this was an affair someone was having trying to cover it up. But regardless of what happened, the man was lynched. He should never have been lynched, obviously. But that stood with me. I knew what all that meant. So this crossing the divide for a little boy of 11, 12, I was 13 years old, and I was with my mother at the Mondawmin Shopping Center, and I saw all these Negro students from colleges picketing the white coffee pot to integrate it. And I asked my mom if I could join the picket line. And uh, in her British way, well, dear, let's go down and ask the picket captain, see what he says. So we did. And they gave me a sign and said, sure, you can march with us. And I marched. And I marched all during the Civil Rights Movement. 
uh, and became a civil rights worker as a young teenager in Baltimore. And crossing the divide then, in some ways was dangerous, in some ways was very strange. It's much different than crossing the divide today. It can be just as dangerous and just as weird, and just as eye-opening. It's a different set of circumstances we have today than I had then when I was young. I was thinking about the thing you just saw here. I thought a lot about what I was going to say today, but the way I do my radio show is I think, I read, I write, I go through all the books, I make myself notes, I put it aside, I get on my radio show, I just do improv. So that's sort of what I do. So I saw Julia Baca up here. The, the video didn't take about the Palestinians. You saw that? I know Julia Baca. I know her not very well, but I know her. I worked with her and her group. And what she was going to show you in that video was that man was the leader of Fatah. There are two groups among the Palestinians, two major groups. One is the group that we're supposed to hate, Hamas. Another group is a group around Fatah, which is the group that runs the Palestinian Authority now in, in the West Bank. This man brought together Christians and Muslims, Fatah, Hamas, in his village of Budros, crossed their divides, crossed their divides, and those are divides, to make a nonviolent movement to save his village, to save their village. Then Israelis came and crossed another divide. You have to be really, truly brave to be a young Israeli and say, what's going on here is wrong, and I'm going to stand up nonviolently with these people, even if I get hurt, beaten, and jailed, to change what has to be changed. So that, what she was talking about, what they do, that work they do, is about crossing divides, and about sharing that divide with all of us. And that's what's critical. People have to have the courage to cross the divide, whatever that takes. Sometimes it just takes listening. That's what this other guy was going to talk about. So let me finish his story, because it could be part of one of the stories I was going to tell anyway. When I first started in radio, the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian, Study, uh, Indian uh, Health asked me to go with them, because they liked my show, to Wisconsin, to the Ojibwe Reservation, for their national meeting. And all these Native people were there, and some white folks were there, and black folks were there, and were having this meeting. And this Lakota woman was taking, making a video. And she made a video, and she said, what is communication? So everybody had to answer these questions. What is communication? And most people in that room, black and white, we all saw the video later, gave fairly complex answers, and I did too about what communication is, the theory of communication, how you talk to one another, how you interact with one another. And almost every native person in that room, when they were asked the question, said one word. Yes, listening. You're right, listening. Listening. That word changed me completely, changed the way I did my radio show, changed the way how I approach human beings, changed the way I thought about what I need to do, changed the way I was a very a political, fi political thinker. I mean, I have my political views that were fairly strong. I was ready to be in your face any minute to tell you you were wrong about what you were saying because I was right. Listening. Then I realized the truth lives in every corner. That conservative the liberal, the radical, black folks, white folks, native folks, every kind of folks, old people, young people, they all own part of the truth. And if you listen, you hear the truth and can cross the divide and learn how common we are, how much we have in common, I mean to say. We can be common too sometimes, but how much have we have in common? and how we can really stand together around things, how things don't have to divide us. And I think that we are often afraid to make this leap, to make that change. Our neighbor, one of our neighbors, lives next door to us, just up our road, Vietnam vet, great guy, head of his foreign legion, uh, American legion, and uh, 
conservative, I mean really, really, really conservative compared to me, who's really over there, and he's really over here. But he would do anything to help me. He'd give the shirt off his back if I needed it. He'd give me the last dollar if I needed it. And I the same. And we, if you hear another human being, that's how you cross that divide. Doesn't mean you're gonna agree, but it means you're gonna hear that we, we have more in common than we have that separates us. And if I say anything, leave anything for today, it's just for everybody to think, no matter what you do, whether it is helping microloans, whether it's listening to people who come from someplace else, hear their stories, listen to who they are when they are not you. And if you do that, you begin to cross divides. You begin to share things with each other. You may even break bread with each other. You may even go on vacations together. You may just hang out together. But the biggest thing is just to listen, to hear other people. When you hear their stories, you're going to hear their stories reflected back and forth. And really, we're one. We are forgetting that. We are one. So if I can leave anything here today, it's just to listen. Don't be judgmental. Take yourself away for a moment. Hear the other human being for who they are. Your life will be more powerful, and those people around you will be more powerful. That's all. Thank you.